The Education Channel presents District Digest, an inside look at the Collier County Public School District. First, the latest news. Thanks for joining us. Here's what's happening. Have you ever heard of flowboarding? Maybe not. For one Baron Collier student, it's not only her passion, she's earned multiple world champion titles. I first got into it when I went on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship a couple years ago, as it, just as a family vacation. That's where I first got introduced to it. So in the first year you became a world champion? Uh, my first year on tour, yes. I was homeschooled my first year and a half of high school and then I was like, hey, might as well try to give this a try and try and do it both at the same time and so far it's working out for me. I think I have like a 4.3 for my GPA. National Honor Society? Yeah, National Honor Society, all that good stuff. How often do you train? Um, well, during the school, we usually just try to go on weekends or whenever, if I can get out of school early, which I have four classes at school, I take a couple online, which just allows me the flexible schedule. So you have really made a lot of the choices around the idea of, I got to fit this training in. Pretty much you got to sacrifice what you can sacrifice, but still try to, you know, get good grades as well as you're doing it. It's one thing to be the best at something. It's another when you take it to another level and create a nonprofit. Tell me about that. <laughs> Gosh, um, yeah. So I created a nonprofit called Support Young Women in Action Sports, and that's just for um, women in action sports. It's not uh, particularly uh, only pertaining to flowboarding, and it's just hopefully if we can try to get that off the ground and just help like young women like myself to follow their dreams. Now coming up on this edition of District Digest, we'll share some helpful prevention tips for parents during cold and flu season. Then we'll speak with a JROTC cadet and get a first-hand account of her experience with Honor Flight. We'll find out about two exciting new programs being offered at Lorenzo Walker Institute of Technology, as well as what's on the horizon. And finally, we'll learn about a community partnership that provides invaluable services to some of our students and their families. That's all straight ahead on this edition of District Digest. Plus, this is Tracy Kohler. Join me for a special feature here on District Digest, coming up in about 10 minutes. We'll tell you what's cool in school. Please stay with us here on the Education Channel, your window to education. On the air on Comcast Cable 99 and online at callyourschools.com. Attention Collier County Public School parents. Have you ever wondered if your child's school bus is running late on any given afternoon? Well, we've got good news. You can now find out if your child's bus is late on the trip home by going online. Check the home page of the school district website at codyourschools.com. When a school bus is delayed by more than a half hour, a late bus notice link appears on the right side of the home page. Click on it to find out. District Digest continues with a special feature. Here's Maribel Darmus. We're opening today's show talking about germs. Better said, how to prevent cold and flu germs. And we have Eileen Vargo, who's the coordinator of health services with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So it's cold and flu season. What uh, should we start looking out for? Well, as you said, November tends to be the time that we start seeing many more individuals who have cold and flu mm -hmm. symptoms. And that certainly is true in our schools as well. Uh, typically, what we will see with someone who has the flu is a fever. Mm -hmm. And that would be a fever over 100, and typically even higher than that, 102, sometimes 104, uh, versus a cold. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has just a cold typically isn't going to have a fever, so that's one good way to help differentiate between sure. the two. So the other symptom or condition that would accompany the flu in most people mm -hmm. would be a sore throat or a cough, or okay. both. Okay. So typically fever, sore throat, and cough are the, the hallmark symptoms of flu. Of the flu as opposed to just a regular cold. Correct, okay. correct. So parents sometimes struggle with when do you keep a child home from school? Obviously there's a lot that goes into it. They may have to stay home from work to take care of them. Maybe they're sick themselves. Should they stay home as well? Mm -hmm. What are, are some guiding tips for, for parents on that? Certainly if a child has a temperature above 100, mm -hmm they should be staying at home. The child's not going to feel well, the child's not going to be able to really perform in class. And that's key too, because sometimes a child may not have a temperature and sure. mom may want to send the child to school, but if the child's tired, mm -hmm. sluggish, 
maybe having a severe cough, whatever, something like that that will prohibit them from participating fully in class, then they should stay at home. Sure. So how about if, if they go to a doctor and maybe get some medication, can medication be sent to the school if they're at a, at a stage that, that they're okay to go to school but they still need to take medication? Certainly. Um, medications just have to be authorized by the physician and signed off by the physician mm -hmm. and brought to school by the parent. Mm -hmm. But yes, we can certainly accommodate that need. So at home, at school, wherever we are, what can we do to prevent the germs <laughs> that exist all over the place? Well, since we can't live in a bubble, right? <laughs> the number one thing that we can do is to get vaccinated against the flu. And that's true for children and adults. Vaccines are recommended for all individuals six months and older, and especially for those who have other chronic medical conditions. Children, for instance, who have asthma, or diabetes mm -hmm. or any other condition that could be made worse if they were to get sick with the flu. The same is true for parents and caregivers of young children because infants are too young to be vaccinated against the flu. So it's important that parents take that extra step and become uh, immunized against this year's flu virus. Sure. So that's number one. But there are additional things that we can do in what we try to teach our children. Certainly the, the acronym that we use is sneeze in your sleeve. So instead of coughing and sneezing into our hand, we want to remind people to cover their, cover their mouth and their nose when they cough and sneeze or sneeze into their elbow or their sleeve. Okay. That's, that's important because the virus is spread from droplets when we cough or sneeze. Hand washing, always, Absolutely. always number one. Absolutely. And hand sanitizer is also effective. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer can be used if soap and water are not available. So I've, I've heard the schools take precautions, um, not only during flu and cold season, but all the time to, to try to prevent as well. What kind of precautions can we find at the schools? Well, certainly our school health staff are always monitoring the occurrence of flu-like illness in the schools. And if we start to see clusters of illness, for instance, three or more students in the same classroom, okay. or similarities in any groupings sure. of kids with, um, with symptoms, they will report that to me and then we get with the principal, we determine if we need to do some additional deep cleaning and disinfection in those classrooms, so we monitor it very closely. And this year, because we're hearing more about enterovirus, sure. we've also um, ordered some additional cleaning supplies, some wipes to be used in some of our more vulnerable, vulnerable classrooms, mm -hmm. such as our pre-K, sure. kindergarten, and our special needs classrooms. Sure. Well, thank you so much for the information. Hopefully the germs will stay away. Let's hope so. <laughs> I appreciate your time here. Thank you. District Digest continues with a special feature. Okay, joining us now is Second Lieutenant Cadet Ashley Rich from Palmetto Ridge High School. Ashley, welcome to District Digest. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. If you notice the military title, she's JROTC at Palmetto Ridge. And she, um, Ashley, you had quite an honor a few weeks ago. You got to go to Washington, D.C. as part, part of Honor Flight. Tell me about that. Um, well, my school, basically my program selected me and we had to go through some rigorous academic things to get into it. And then, I mean, you had two meetings beforehand. You met, you had guardian training, and then you met your guardian and your veteran. Oh, I'm the guardian, so I met the veteran. I already know me. And then we went on the flight. There was two times. You met them once beforehand, and then you went on the flight. And Tell me about your veteran. Um, his name is Joseph Logan. He was in the U.S. Coast Guard. He did 32 years DOD. He enlisted March of 45, so right at the end of World War II. And he was on a receiving base when the war, war ended, so he didn't get shipped out. He stayed in the States. Um, he's from Massachusetts, just like me, so I mean, that was pretty awesome. We got along pretty well then. And he he was, a, he was a pleasure. He was a blast. I had so much fun with him. We became like best friends. He was fist pounding everyone and fist pounding me. Like it was a lot of fun. I loved it. Fun. Was it emotional? Emotional? Yeah. Uh, I teared up a bit, honestly, a couple times. Hearing some of the stories, uh, it was, it was breathtaking. And the amount of them, like the amount of incurred, like, courage it took for them to go in because some of them some of them weren't drafted they they enlisted they wanted to go out and help the country and there was some Iwo Jima survivors there some doctors that were on Normandy Beach it was it was definitely emotional but emotional in a good way so you're walking around let's say the World War II Memorial mm -hmm. you, you visited many memorials right uh, yes so you're working you're walking through the World War II Memorial what are you seeing what are you feeling what are you taking in 
Well, we first got off the bus and we had to get the wheelchair set up. And obviously, the people that don't know Honor Flight's being there today, it's kind of everyone's kind of looking around. We have two buses. There's 110 of us all getting off the bus, and we were allowed to just we had to walk around, but we had to get a group picture. But going up to the World War II Memorial to get down to the bottom level of it to take the picture, everyone was stopping was stopping all the veterans, shaking their hands and thanking them. And uh, Mr. Logan was saying how it was it was so inspirational and it was so awesome because he never really got that. And a lot of the veterans never really got the welcome back that they needed. And this was their memorial. That's what the whole trip was about, is bringing them to their memorial where they needed to be. And a lot of them haven't seen it. He had been to D.C. before with his... Um, with his family, and the memorial was built in 2004, so he hasn't seen it. A lot of them hadn't seen it, and it was it was emotional. They they loved it though. They seemed to take it in, and they loved every second of it. I don't think there was a single dry eye by the end of the trip. It was it was pretty awesome. What's your biggest takeaway from it? Um, basically, I don't I don't really know. Everyone's asking me that. They're like, "What do you take away most of it? What was your favorite part?" What was this? What was that? And there is no favorite part. The whole day, the whole entire day spending it with these 100 people was the most amazing day of my life. And if I could, I would do it every single day for the rest of my life. It was amazing. Just the energy I got off of everyone. And everyone was just so happy. You know, it was just such a good time. And they never, they never got the homecoming. And they got it when we flew back home. And the, there wasn't much to, a lot was taken from it. I mean, it, it changes your way of viewing things, actually. It was good, though. Speaking of your way of viewing things, you're a cadet. I am. Looking at a future in the military. Yes, possibly. Does, yes. does this experience galvanize that decision, push you further that way, um, open your eyes more? Yes, it does. Because the selflessness it took for them to go into the service during this time of need, of the time of need of the country of the 40s during World War II, it was, it was a lot. It took a lot for them to join, the ones that did, and the ones that were drafted, I mean, they still talk about it. But it does influence me a little because I see if they had this much courage to do things, I can definitely accomplish this and I can go into the military and I can do great things just like they did. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we got a, about 30 seconds left. Take a little time to brag about Palmetto Ridge. Your drill team <laughs> did very well. Yes. Um, in March of this year, our drill team came in second place. And then it was, we beat out, we beat out Naples, but Laley beat us. And then this Next week, and actually on the 14th and 15th, we have our county Raider comms, which hoping our Raider teams will come in first place. So it'll be fun. It's, our school's pretty awesome. Excellent. Ashley Rich, second lieutenant, the <laughs> JRTC program at Palmetto Ridge High School. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. District Digest continues as we open your window to education, taking you inside the classroom so you can see what's cool in school. With BYOD, STEM, and today's cool school technology, here's Dr. Tracy Kohler. This school year, every fourth grade student in the district will be participating in a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM competition during the school day. Fourth graders will be investigating, designing, and prototyping their own projects using Little Bits. Little Bits modules are tiny color-coded circuit boards that snap together magnetically. Their simple, unique functions like power, light, and sound allow students to create simple circuits in seconds. No soldering, wiring, or programming required. But first, all fourth grade teachers had the opportunity to participate in a day-long professional learning session with Little Bits. This hands-on experience gave teachers a wonderful student learning perspective and a great lesson in perseverance. Ms. Sherry Ashley from Laley Elementary explains. The little bit modules allow the teachers a chance to interact with the STEM process and we can help um, troubleshoot for problems that the students might face and replicate it in the classroom and help them brainstorm ideas on how to overcome those difficulties. And District Instructional Technology Specialist Mary Marshall describes the features of Little Bits and a few curriculum connections that teachers and students will experience. Well, in the fourth grade curriculum during the fourth quarter, which is when we have our STEM competition, uh, teachers are, are teaching uh, energy transfer and transformation. They teach types of energy, uh, electrical energy, mechanical energy, and so the students get to actually build something and show those energy transfers. Little bits are built uh, in such a way that different colors represents different parts of a circuit. Blue is power, pink is input, 
orange are wires, and green is output. So when they're putting this puzzle together, they can think analytically about how they want their circuit to look and whether or not it would work before they even put it together. So it's a great way to teach electric cir electronics and circuits and um, you know, just use that problem solving process. So everyone has the opportunity to become an inventor through using these electronic circuits called Little Bits. And now you know what's cool in school. It's time for our District Digest School Special. Next on the program is Denise Duzek. She's the administrator at Lorenzo Walker Institute of Technology. Denise, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Every time I talk to somebody at Lorenzo Walker, I keep hearing there's new programs, there's new offerings. You have two now. Tell me about those and then also tell me about the ones you're adding in the future. I'm so excited to talk about them because new programs are somewhat of a rarity because of funding. We've had some unique funding opportunities and because of that, in August, we introduced a pharmacy tech program and also a vet assisting program. So both of those programs have quite a few students. It's going extremely well. We're expecting very high placement rates. We have some absolutely amazing teachers teaching a real hands-on curriculum. We're involving community vets, we're involving community pharmacies, so our students will have a lot of opportunities to practice the work in the community before they get placed, and we expect 100% placement in both programs. Tell me about the instructors, because I think some people out there may assume, okay, you get instructors and you teach them the new subject matter. You actually have experts from their field that are in these classrooms, correct? Absolutely. We are a very unique school in that our teachers must be excellent teachers in addition to being licensed in the field that they teach. So for pharmacy tech, we have an amazing woman who is actually a licensed pharmacist in South America. And she um, had been working in Publix and was very successful, but felt a calling to teach. She's very much a natural teacher, so those students are benefiting from her amazing expertise. And in vet assisting, we were fortunate to get a retired vet from Chicago. And his knowledge base obviously is amazing. So even though now that's only a high school program, beginning in January, we will admit adult students as well. So we're really excited about that. They're both excellent teachers with an amazing resource of knowledge. Uh, tell me about the two new programs that are on the horizon. These are real world classes that can lead to real world money. Absolutely, amazing money. Like, for example, we have many automotive graduates who are earning six-figure salaries. So looking at um, needs within our community, we identified several, one being for a full-time welding program, and that will begin in January of this year. We're beginning to take registrations now. And then beginning in August, because we need to do some building modifications to accommodate it, we're going to start HVAC, heating, air conditioning, um, refrigeration, and we're expecting those graduates to do extremely well. When you choose the programs to expand to, it makes, me, it, makes it sound like the building industry is back in southwest Florida. Well, we believe that it is. We believe that it's returning. And the way that we choose our programs is very specific. We analyze job openings for our region, which is Region 24. So the authorities do the research to tell us what jobs we can expect to open in the near future, but also they have to be what's considered high wage occupations, which would be a minimum of $10.50 or preferably much more than that. So we have to meet certain criteria before our accrediting agencies or the state will even allow us to open a new program. To 
to our viewers who may not realize, you have 30 plus years at this school. Yes. Tell me what it feels like to, I mean, you guys offer many amazing programs, but the results that happen there in six months, a year, 18 months, talk about that. Well, I have a wonderful job because when I started this job, there were less than 600 students in our school and now there's about 2,000. So I have the benefit of living and working in this community and wherever I go, whether it's to get my hair cut or my blood drawn or to get my car fixed, I recognize our students and they're able to tell me how our school has changed their life. So it's been a really wonderful career and, and we really do make a difference in the lives of the people in this community. We have wonderful partnerships with local employers. They open their arms to us. And in general, I think the status of career and technical education has been raised so substantially over time. The stigma's coming off of it, isn't it? Well, I think when college graduates come out of school and cannot find a job and end up back in our programs in order to be employable, they recognize that a college degree isn't always the key to financial success. So we look, where are the jobs that are going to pay well? Let's get you in and out. Let's get you a job. And I think that's the formula for success. Denise Duzik, Administrator, Lorenzo Walker, Institute of Technology, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. District Digest presents a community update. Here's Leanne Zinzer. Well, our final guest on District Digest is Stephanie Campbell, the Executive Director of Grace Place for Children and Families. Stephanie, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, Grace Place, I mean, for folks that don't know, we have a very strong partnership with the school district and Grace Place. Yes, we've been working with the school district for 10 years now. We're just 10 years old, celebrating our birthday. Um, Grace Place is located in Golden Gate City, so we work with Golden Gate Elementary mm -hmm. and Golden Terrace, Golden Gate Middle and Golden Gate High School, and that whole city sure. there. Um, and we provide services for the students and children, but for the whole family. So from birth through adults to help support what the schools are doing and children's success in school. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that, that family literacy. Because you work, yes. it's not just focusing on the child, but involving the entire family. How do you do that? Exactly. There are three program areas we focus on. The first one is that early childhood years. We know how critical those are for children to be ready for kindergarten in order to succeed in school. And so our programs are called Bright Beginnings. They're nationally recognized. They're part of the Barbara Bush Foundation mm -hmm. for Family Literacy. They prepare that child for school, but they teach the parent to be the child's first teacher, to be involved in the child's education, and to provide all the rich experiences of language and literacy and learning that an early childhood child needs mm -hmm. to, uh, to prepare for school, that parents are also learning English and their own literacy. Mm -hmm. Then we focus on the school age student. So K through eight is called Academy of Leaders. And that is a after school program, but it's very academically rich, um, very strong on STEM. And it's called Academy of Leaders because we're big on the character enrichment, character development, giving back to the community, being a good citizen. Mm -hmm. So all of that happens there. Our high school program is called AP Leadership builds on that, prepares these students to graduate from high school, but then go on to college and careers and come back as, as prepared um, citizens themselves. And then wrapped all around, always with the parents involved. So parents are taking English classes, literacy classes, um, financial literacy, citizenship, parent meetings, parent focus, very much involved in their child's education. Mm -hmm. And we all know how important that is, and, and like we were talking beforehand, sometimes it's not, it's not that parents don't want to be involved, they just don't know how. So you're giving them, obviously, all the tools that they need in order to make that, that leap much easier for them. Exactly. Um, the, any parent wants the best sure. for their child. But we're dealing with parents from poverty, mm -hmm. parents with English as a second language, but parents who have a low education themselves, so they don't understand the institutions and the systems of education, how to navigate those, what their role is as a parent, we find them step right up and get very excited about how they can be involved in their child's education. And we hear back from the schools that they become the leaders in that mm -hmm. school, even though they are parents with all these barriers right. and issues themselves. Um, they do. 
That's wonderful mm -hmm. to hear. Let's talk a little bit about the 21st Century Grant where you offer elementary and middle school after school programs for the students. Yes. We were just approved um, last month for a Florida Department of Education 21st Century Learning Center grant. That's a <laughs> mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yes. But uh, Collier County may be aware of that at the Miracle Program in Immokalee. Right. So that's what it is. And it will allow us to expand the number of students that we serve in Golden Gate City greatly, but also focus on those STEM subjects. Mm -hmm. That is a big focus yes. of the school system. And provide all those other services that help a child get very involved and interested in their own future so they um, can follow pursuits that we can't always do during the school day. Right. and they can um, support all that happens mm -hmm. in the school day. And speaking of expansion, you yes. have an expansion project coming up in order to be able to serve so many more students. Yes, it's a very busy fall at Grace Place. <laughs> so not only are we expanding with the after school programs, mm -hmm. but we are expanding our campus. So we're breaking ground and we uh, will be um, adding 16,000 square feet of Goodness. education space in Golden Gate City. Um, so we're very excited about that and that begins and in November and will be uh, completed in, in 2015, ready to uh, expand to more students. That's wonderful. And that's always the important thing is, is the more we can reach, the more kids that we can reach, the more families that we can reach, Absolutely. the more impact you have. Yes. Stephanie, thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And we'd like to thank all of our guests on District Digest, and we'd like to thank you for watching. For Greg Turcata, Maribel DeArmas, and everyone here on the Education Channel, I'm Leanne Zinzer. We'll see you next time. Join us again for District Digest, your inside look at the Collier County Public School District. The show is produced by the District Communications and Community Engagement Department and the Education Channel, your window to education.